All right. Good morning, everyone. First of all, Happy New Year. Happy and healthy New Year for you all. Welcome to the seminar series. We are continuing in this second semester that we open with, uh, with the talk by Germain, who is presently a PhD student uh, with us, working uh, with uh, Denis. Yeah, and he obtained his master degrees, dual degree, I believe, right, from uh, France and uh, Sweden. Yeah, and he is currently working on a new instrument uh, for a visitor instrument for VLTI. Yeah, and I uh, also learned that he likes singing, so hopefully he will close his talk uh, with a song today. Yeah, <laughs> the floor is yours, Ramon. Ah, oh, it's strange. I thought you would taunt me on the soup thing, not the singing. Okay, never mind. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm very happy to see all these faces for this first semi seminar. I was expecting, I was not expecting that many people for this seminar, but it's nice. So I have this challenging task to summarize the knot instrument in 45 minutes, which is a challenge. So I will do the best I can to not go too much in the details of the technical instrumentation, but at the end it will come to this point, so don't worry if you lose track of what I'm talking about, it's not a problem. I, will, I did the best I can to make it as simple as possible for everyone to understand. So, NOT is here for Elban Nulling Interferometry at the VLTI. Now, I know that in this title already a lot of things are confusing for some people, maybe the VLTI is confusing for a couple, the Albans may be for a bit more people, and Nulling interferometry is widely unknown to most of you I know. So I will start by giving a bit of context and definitions that is useful for everyone to understand what I will talk about later. So first, the VLTI is an ESO facility that is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. It has eight telescopes. For the four UTs, I have eight meter diameter fixed telescope, and the 80s, oh no, that's not the right one. Yes, the 80s are around two meter mobile telescope. They can move. Right now, there are three operational instruments at the VLTI. There is Pionier, and I said Pionier, not Pioneer. <laughs> there is Matisse and Gravity that is going through an upgrade for Gravity Plus that should end in 2026. And Asgard will be, as Andrew said, will be the new visitor instrument for the VLTI. It was officially approved by ESO on June 2023. Now, the L-band. What is the L-band? So you know that in visible light, most of the light from the sun is going through the atmosphere without any problem. But, but when we start to work in the infrared, uh, infrared, some part of the light will be absorbed or scattered with the atmosphere, and some part of the light will be transmitted. So these transmission windows that you see here, we call them bands. And the L bands is between 3.5 and 4 micrometer. All the absorption and dispersion is mainly due to uh, H, so water and CO2. These are the main reasons why the infrared uh, is not transmitted by the atmosphere at some uh, wavelengths. But you have all the bands in the infrared, Y, J, H, K, L, M, N. And at the VLTI, most of these bands are observed by instrument. You can see Pionier, Gravity, and Matisse. The knot instrument will be in the L band that is already observed by Matisse. But another instrument that is part of Asgard, I will come to that later, will also observe these shorter wavelength bands here, Y and J, that are not observed currently. OK, so why are we interested in the L band? It's because all of you who had like a master degree in astronomy and astrophysics, you know that the emission from a star is decreasing when you go in the infrared, while the emission from a planet is increasing because the temperature of a planet is lower than the temperature of a star. So it means that when you move to the infrared, the contrast between the star and the planet is decreasing. And thanks to that, it means that when we want to detect or image a planet, when the contrast is lower, it means that you can detect planets with a lower temperature. So for our instrument, we expect it to have to be around 400 K. You can see here, this is the contrast for a planet around 400 K temperature. And you see that in the H and K band, this contrast is 10 minus seven. And here, it can go to 10 minus four, which is already something better for a detection. 
you can also try to detect planets that are older, so they are less bright, but also planets that are lighter, uh, down to four masses of Jupiter for our instrument. This is also a spectral band that is quite rich in CO2 and water vapor and methane, so that's interesting. And now the big part. Oop. Yes, it's working. And now the big part, the newling interferometry, that I will try to ex explain the best I can, but I know that people tend to forget very quickly the explanation, so I will try to make it as simple as possible. So first, about classical interferometry that we call stellar interferometry. It consists of using several telescopes, in this case two. They are separated by a distance that we call the baseline, and they all observe the same target. And then the light is reflected to a beam combiner when it is focused on a detector. If you have the same path to the detector here, the light will not be coherent because, as you can see, unless your target is at the zenith, you will have a path difference here compared to the light that is coming on the second telescope. And this path difference results in a phase difference on the detector. This means that the photons will not be coherent. So you need to implement delay lines for each of the telescopes to correct this path difference and have the, fa the same phase for the photons when they arrive on the detector so that they can interfere and make fringes. The big advantage of interferometry is the angular resolution. For a single telescope, angular resolution is the lambda divided by the diameter of the telescope. But for an interferometer, it is lambda divided by the baseline. So it means that if you can have two telescopes with a one kilometer baseline, this gives you the same angular resolution as a telescope that would have a one kilometer diameter. For the VLTI, the maximum baseline is given by the 80s. They can go as far as 200 meters. So this gives you the same angular resolution as a, as a telescope that would have a 200 meter diameter mirror. So this is hopefully something that you cannot make in real life for a single telescope. But for interferometry, this is something that is possible. So that's for classical interferometry. Now, Newling interferometry is a never more niche domain than stellar interferometry. So we start with the same as normal interferometry. We have several telescopes observing the same targets, which is a star. Now, you can move your delay lines so that the light coming from the star arrives in phase on the detector. So this will give you a constructive interference. And now, if you apply a pi phase shift to one of the two telescopes, then the photons will arrive, instead of being coherent, they will arrive in opposite phase. So they will suffer a destructive interference, and the light from the star will not be transmitted to the detector. But if around the star you have dust or a planet that is orbiting around, this object will be slightly off-centered compared to the star, and this, this will result in a small phase delay between the photons, which means when they arrive on the detector, they will not be in phase. So when you apply the pi phase shift, they will not be in opposite phase, so they will not suffer a destructive interference, and thus they will, they will be transmitted. I don't know if you see it. You're supposed to see a very faint uh, light here. Well. Anyway, this is a way to detect things that are off-center. So this is what your interferometer is seeing. This is what we call the transmission map on your field of view. These are not, you cannot really see these fringes on the detector. I want to, be, to make that clear. These are only showing you the region of the sky that will not be transmitted to the detector. These are the dark fringes. And the regions that will be transmitted to the detector that are the white fringes. The point is to have the star always at the center of the central dark fringe, so the light will never be transmitted to the detector. But for a planet or a disk of dust, you can see there is no problem. Depending on the position of this object, it can be transmitted without any problem. And Newling interferometry is even more powerful than that because Remember, I was telling you, the angular resolution is the same as if you were building a telescope of 200 meters. Well, that's even better than that. If you were actually building this telescope of 200 meters, you would get this orange circle 
to be your angular resolution or the inner working angle, which is the smallest angle where you can detect an object. But you can see that if you use interferometry, you actually get fringes inside these coronographic regimes. So it means that using interferometry, you can actually access angles that are four times slower than what you could access with a single telescope. Okay, maybe I lost some people, I don't know. So just to make it clear, what I want everyone to remember, remember maybe for more than a few days, that would be great, is that nulling interferometry is the combination between high angular resolution from interferometry and high contrast from destructive interference. This is the big thing to remember. So now, more about the Asgard instrument, uh, that is the topic of the talk today, or more the not instrument, but to make it clear about Asgard. Asgard will be the visitor instrument that will be installed at the VLTI, but it is actually a combination of four instruments, two of what, what I call calibration instruments, it's not an official name, but I call, it, I call them like this, Balder and Hemdar. <laughs> Balder will be an instrument that will he be here for wavefront sensing. So it will be here to see the wavefront errors that are coming from perturbation of the atmosphere, from the changes in temperature and pressure, and correct it in the age band. Hemdar will be the fringe tracker of our instruments. A fringe tracker is something you always need when you do an interferometer, and this is what will give you the performance of your interferometer. Basically, do you, you remember the delay lines that we moved to correct the difference of path delay in, your, in the interferometer? Well, the problem is this difference of path delay changes with time, depending also on the atmosphere, but also the vibrations at the, t at the observatory. This is something that you need to correct during your observation, like at a few hundred frequencies, because it's, it can change very fast. So this is, is what you need, a fringe tracker that is here to track the changes in the fringes and correct it during your observation. And then you have the two science instruments, NOT and Bifrost. So NOT will be the first nuller in the southern hemisphere to do exoplanet imaging with spectral resolution of 20, 400, and 2,000. And the other one is Bifrost. This one is a classical stellar interferometer, but that will access shorter wavelengths than gravity and pionier, and with high spectral resolution from 50 to 25,000. Uh, I will skip this slide. It was just to show that in the lab, this is where Asgard will be, and this is an optomechanical design for the whole Asgard instrument, where you can see that Bifrost is really taking a lot of space. And we are this tiny thing be below, below the table. So now, about the science goals, because I think most of you would be interested in this part of the talk. So the point of the instrument is to image planets near the snow line. The snow line is the distance from a star where the water can only exist as ice, cannot be liquid anymore. So if you take this image, for example, of the HR8799 planetary system, you can see if the star was the sun, you would have the Jupiter's orbit in the orange, orange circle, and the red circle would be the snow line. So this is what we want to achieve. This picture was taken by the VLT, by Sphere, and I said Sphere. <laughs> uh, and this is what we want to achieve with NOT. So you see, the, this is a big step up in terms of angular resolution that we want to achieve. This image here corresponds to the red circle that you see here, that is the capability of the VLT and 8-meter class telescopes in terms of angular resolution. In orange, you have what the ELT will be able to achieve. You see that the ELT should be able to touch a bit the snow line, but the VLTI is really what's giving the best angular resolution to really probe with a good resolution the snow line and the planets that are here. And if you see the curve, the red curve, the green curve here, this is the distribution of planets that we expect in this region. And you see that the snow line is where we expect the most planets 
to be present. So that's why scientifically we are very interested in this region and to image this region because we expect a lot of planets to be here. What is next? Yes, for uh, our instrument we calculated a yield prediction. The yield prediction is the number of planets that we expect to detect with our instrument. So to calculate this yield, we have a catalog. We are making a catalog of uh, more than a thousand stars that are uh, different kinds of stars that will all be quite nearby, so less than 150 parsec, and all young stars less than 300 million years. And we populate these stars with planets using two formation models, the gravitational instability model and the uh, core accretion models. So we populate these stars with these planets, so we get the figure that is on the right here. The GI planets are in blue and the core accretion planets are in red. So you can see on the y-axis this is the contrast with the star and here is the angular separation. And you can see already that core accretion planets are more difficult to image because they have a higher contrast and a lower angular separation with their star. So now the last step is to estimate the performance, the detectability of these planets with our instruments. So we use the performance estimator that was made by Romain, that is sci-fi sim, and this gives us the black curve here that are the detectability of the planets with our instrument. And you see that using the UTs, we can really probe this region that is very rich of core accretion planets, which would be the first time that core accretion planets are imaged because any other instrument today is not able to achieve, uh, the re is able to resolve this region. You see like Shine, for example, which was a survey done with Sphere at the VLT, was not able to go close to this region and was not able to detect core accretion planets. So, in summary, uh, if we are using the Gaia catalog, the Gaia GR3 catalog, we expect to be able to detect four GI planets within a 15 stars run, but no core accretion planets for reason that I will not develop here. But if we have a 15 stars run for random stars, not only Gaia catalog, but every type of star, then we expect to have 10 brown dwarfs and four core accretion planets within a 15 stars run. All of them would be near the snow line as expected, and all of them would have a mass that is as low, uh, as low as four mass of Jupiter as minimum. This figure here is just the same figure as before, but just for core accretion planets and with the distribution of mass. And I, I guess you can't really see it, but this rectangle here, blue rectangle, is the zone that is detectable by not. So all these planets would be detectable by not. The second science goal is exozodiacal disks. So these disks are much older than the for planet formation. They are usually happen after one or two billion years for around a star. They, this is mainly dust that is coming from comets and asteroid collision. This is a dust that is around the habitable zone of a star. You see that it has been detected by the LB LBTI on the northern hemisphere, but for now no instrument in the southern hemisphere really studied these disks. So that will be another science goal of not to image these exozodiacal disks from the southern hemisphere. And for this, we have a collaboration with a new NASA project that is led by the University of Arizona that is specialized on imaging these disks. Okay, now we need to go in more details of how the instrument is working. And I warn you, this is going to get more technical from this point. We start with what I believe is the core of our instrument, the most important part of the instrument, and also the most advanced technologically, is the chip that is the size of my finger, but it is the element that is able to recombine the light from the four telescopes and to generate interferences with it. This is made of glass, gallium lanthanum sulfide, that is a glass that is transparent in the L-band, and we start with a block of, well, a, a small chip of glass, and then we can print waveguides using an ultra-fast laser inscription. 
And these waveguides are acting like optical fibers. It means that as soon as light is injected in it, it can propagate with minimum losses inside the chip. And that's a very useful way to have sta stable and compact interferences and uh, also a stable and compact way to propagate this light. Um, and it's also easier to implement because if you don't have this chip, then you have to use mirrors, optical mirrors that are like much more difficult to align, much more difficult to implement. Uh, so this is also a way to implement uh, the interference. This chip has four inputs that are for the four telescopes of the VLTI and eight outputs. Four of these eight outputs are photometric outputs, which means it's only taking like 20% of the light that is injected and bringing back to, to the chip, uh, at the end of the chip. This is a way to estimate how much light we inject in each of the inputs. We have two bright outputs that are the constructive interference, because every time you have a destructive interference, you need to have a constructive interference somewhere else. The, the, the light from the star is not vanishing in the air like this. So the light from the star will go to these outputs, and we have two null outputs that are all the off-axis light from dust and planets and some stellar liquid that is still coming in these outputs and that will limit the contrast between the planet and the star. This is a schematic of the chip. You can see the four inputs here of the VLTI, the eight outputs, photometric, bright, and null. And the, the way the chip is working is that it's a two-stage uh, coupling system. I will not go in the detail of why we have these two stages because it will get way too technical. But for one coupler, the way it works and the way we are doing interferences is that two waveguides are getting very close to each other, like a sub-millimeter distance between each other, and they're getting so close that the photons can start to interact from one waveguide to another, and they can start to interfere even with the wa even if the waveguides are not touching each other. So that's a way to generate interferences with this chip. Now, the problem I had to face when I started my PhD is how do we get the light from the VLTI and how do we inject it inside this chip? Because as soon as the light is injected inside the chip, this is basically automatic. The chip is doing everything uh, without us without us having to interfere with it. But how do we get this light to be injected in the chip? The most efficient, stable, and easy solution that is used in Pionier and gravity is to use optical fibers. So you just inject the light in your fiber, and then you bring your fiber just in front of the input of the chip, and then the light is going there. But unfortunately for not, this would require to have fibers that are optimized in the L-band that maintain polarization and that resist cold temperatures inside a cryostat because the chip needs to be inside a cryostat to be at a low temperature. And unfortunately, this doesn't exist. And I have an anecdote about this. So pe colleagues from me, like in Grenoble, told me that once they tried to order this kind of experimental fibers that a company made them, that it was able to have this performance. And they, they got it, and one of the colleagues just took it, and it broke instantly in his hand. So that's the kind of thing we don't want for our instrument. We want to have something that is reliable and more reliable than that. So the second option is to use direct imaging, uh, direct injection. So it, the technique is simply using a lens to focus the light on the inputs. That's, simply, that's as simple as that. You see you have a lens here focusing the light and then you have the four beams of the VLTI that are focused on the, each of their inputs. So this gives us the optical design of the, of the knot instrument. So I will go in the details of, of this. So you see the four beams are arriving from the VLTI here. They first enter the Hemdahl instrument for having the fringe tracking, the wavefront correction with the deformable mirror. And then, when they are all corrected and nice, they are reflected here towards our instrument along the optical table. 
we have some internal delay lines here to correct for the phase, the difference in our instruments. And then they are reflected. And then we have these very important optics, also the smallest, but the most important one is what we call the slicer. And in my opinion, this slicer is the jewel of our instrument because it was the most expensive one, but also because it is the most uh, new one because from my knowledge, non, uh, such an optic was never used in another instrument before. So the purpose of this, is, of this optic is to recombine these four beams of the VLTI. So you can see like before that, you have the four beams with the separation. And after it, you have the four beams that are combined with the same diameter, same position. So how do you go from there to there? Well, you focus the four beams on four different mirrors. These are like four different slices of mirrors with each of them with a different angle. So you receive the light and you then you reflect it in the same direction. So you see the beams arrive like this and then they are all reflected in the same direction and almost same position. So that's a way to recombine the light from the four VLTI telescope and then they are reflected back to the chip where we use the lens to inject it on the inputs uh, as I told you. So this is a picture of the slicer. We actually received it this Monday and so we are very happy to have it. It looks amazing. As you can see, it's quite small. The mirrors here are like five millimeters diameter in total. So this requires a lot of mechanical engineering to implement it precisely on the optical design, but we are very ha happy about the result. I will go quickly about the cold optics. So you can see here the lens and the chip will be inside the cryostat. The chip will generate the interference. We'll have, we'll have the eight outputs, the photometric, bright, and nude. And then we have the cold optics with the spectrograph. So we use grisms to disperse the light with the different spectral resolution. And then we image the spectrum on a detector. The cryostat will be at 90 Kelvin. This is not part of my work, so I will not go in details of this. What I will go in details of is are the performances of the optical design of NOT because this is really the important part of my work. So to estimate the performance of NOT, we are using two parameters. The first one is the null depth. The null depth is the portion of the stellar light that is going in the null output. So ideally, we want this to be zero. We want 0% 0 of the stellar light to go in the null output. So this fraction of stellar light, is called, we, we call it the stellar leakage, and this is giving us the maximum contrast that we can have between the star and the planet. If we have 0% of the stellar light going in the null output, then we can basically see every planet around the star. If we have a lot of leakage, then we will have to observe very bright exoplanets because otherwise the light of the star, the stellar liquid will be too much. This is the first parameter. The second one is the throughput. The throughput is the fraction of light that is able to propagate throughout, throughout all the instrument. So at the beginning, so when the telescope is collecting the light, you have 100% of the photons. And at the end, you have a certain portion 10, 20, 40% of these photons that actually arrive at your detector. So this is another parameter that we use to estimate the performance of the optical design. So first, the null depth. You will realize that this null depth depends on a lot of parameters. I don't know if I have time to, no, I don't have time to go in details of all of them, so I will go quite quickly on some of them. The first one is what we call the astrophysical null. This is the limit that is coming from the size of the star. If you observe a star that is very close and very big, then the, 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 the destructive interference will not be able to uh, delete the light from all of the star. Uh, will, you will have more liquid that is coming from the size of the star. So the bigger and the closer a star is, the more liquid you will have, and so the less contrast you will be able to have. This is a big limit for stars that are too close, and also for binaries, uh, indeed. The other problem comes from wavefront errors. 
So again, from the atmosphere, the perturbations from the atmosphere, you get a phase error that is across the pupil of your telescope, and these phase errors result in a certain null depth. The more error you have, the more liquid you will have in your system. Luckily, we have a magical solution that is called using the chip with the waveguides in single mode. So when you, zoo, when you use waveguides in the chip that has one mode, you are able to filter out all these errors at once. I see some people confused, but I will not go in the detail of that because it's a bit too complex. What you need to know is that this is very efficient, but in the process, you will lose at least 20% of your light. And I will go in the detail of that a bit later. Other problem is the piston phase difference. So I told you when the atmosphere is changing or when you have vibration in your observatory, the optical path delay between the light of your telescope is fluctuating, and this fluctuation results in a null depth uh, limit. So the way to correct it is to have delay lines. These are from the VLTI, but they can only correct it to up to a millimeter level. So to correct it for more, de uh, more precisely, you can use adaptive optics, changing the shape of a mirror to correct the sub-millimeter um, variation of optical path and correct it in a dynamic and very precise way. Other problem is coming from the water vapor and the CO2 in the atmosphere that is giving us a chromatic longitudinal dispersion that cannot be corrected by the delay line. So the only way to correct it is to use birefringent material or a CO2 chamber we call this a longitudinal dispersion corrector, LDC, that you can see here. I will also not go in the detail, but this is what we are planning to use to correct the water vapor in the CO2. So to give you a concrete example, if you don't have any correction, this is the phase you will get across the pa passband. If you use only delay lines, you can only achieve this but you still have uh, around like 10 radian phase dispersion, and this is coming from the water vapor and the CO2. And so if you correct them too, you can have this phase dispersion that is only around 0.01 radian. So this is super crucial to correct the impact of water vapor and CO2, because otherwise you won't be able to do nulling interferometry. We also have uh, problems with birefringence. So birefringence is when you have two polarization, ho vertical, horizontal, and both of them are not traveling at the same speed in your instrument. So you also need to correct that. We have the polarization angle, which is negligible. It's not really a problem. And you have the intensity mismatch. If one of your telescope is collecting much more photons than another one, this is also limiting your system. So, maybe some of you were lost because I know it's a lot of technical details and I went quite fast over it. What you need to understand is that the universe doesn't want us to do nulling interferometry. This is the point to get from it, but we are still doing it. And this is the estimation that we have. Before the correction, this is the null depth that we have. Impossible to do nulling interferometry with this. You see the water vapor in CO2, is the biggest of the impact, but you also have the piston error from the vibrations of the observatory. But if we apply the different corrections, we can achieve this null depth that is getting really close to the goal of 10 minus 3 that we want to have. So 10 minus 3 means that you reduce the light of the star by a factor of 1,000 on your null output. And we see that the biggest problem here is coming from the vibrations of the observatory. This is indeed the biggest problem that we were expecting for nulling interferometry. And luckily, this is not part of my optical design, so I am technically not responsible for solving this problem. Uh, the throughput, how much time do I have? I still have a bit of time. Um, the main problem, the main uh, phenomenon that is reducing the throughput of the system in, is when we inject the light into the chip. So I told you, we are using single mode waveguides that are able to correct the wavefront errors, but we are losing 
around 20% of the light in the process. So why is that? It's because when you focus the light on the chip, you will get a point spread function that ideally will be an airy pattern that you can see in green here. And the, wave the mode of the waveguide, since it's single mode, it will be a Gaussian, the fundamental mode of the waveguide. The problem is to couple into the waveguide, the light pattern needs to be similar to the Gaussian. If you want 100% of the light to go inside the waveguide, you would need the point spread function to be a Gaussian. But because there is a mismatch here that is irreducible, there is a mismatch here, then not all the light can go inside the waveguide. There will be some loss in the process. And this is why even in the best case scenario, you can only have 80% of the light going inside the chip, which means 20% loss. But this injection efficiency really depends on the shape of your point spread function and your Gaussian. If for some reason you have a distortion of, these, uh, of this uh, intensity profile, if you go away from the airy pattern or if the waveguide mode is changing a bit, you can really lose very quickly your injection efficiency. So although the 20% here is something we cannot reduce, all these other impacts, all the, all the other phenomena that can impact the injection efficiency, this is something we can work on and to minimize them as much as possible the manufacturing errors, the diffraction, the misalignments in the, in the system, the wavefront errors, all of this is something we can resolve uh, and reduce as much as possible to limit it at less than 5%. This is what we want to achieve. So this is the total throughput of our system. You can see that in total, we lose 60% of the light, which is a uh, decent amount for a professional instrument at the VLTI. Uh, this is what we expect. 20 so almost half of it is coming from Fresnel losses. So this is due to reflection and transmission is in, in the optics. We can't really optimize this more than that. 20% is indeed coming from the injection. A part is coming from the wavefront errors that are from Balder. And this part here, here is what we can work on to minimize. This is all the phenomena in our optical uh, system that we were able to minimize to get as less uh, throughput as possible. So you see here, this was a 5% goal. We wanted the complete loss to be less than 5%. I will not go in details of all the different phenomena, the diffraction, uh, wavefront errors and stuff, but you see that we are quite close to the goal. So we are considering that our optical design is optimized since it is the lowest source of throughput loss compared to the other ones that we cannot really uh, correct. I wanted to talk a bit the, about the test bench, but I will not have time, unfortunately. So I will just show you these slides that I prepared with love for you, but I won't have time to show you. This is maybe what I can show. This is the first null measurements that we did in our lab. So you see, we're able, this is a fringe pattern. The null position is, is at the center here. And we have a delay line in our test bench that we can move. And so by moving into the null position, we can reach the null uh, like this. So this is a nice result we got a couple of months ago. So I, I just wanted to show it to you. But now I can go to the conclusion of the presentation. So the next step are to assemble the full system. For now, we just have a test bench, but now that the optical design is done and finished, we are done ordering all the optics. Now we are finishing ordering some materials that we need to assemble the whole system. For now, the test bench that we have is only generating us two beams of light, so it can only interfere two beams, but to have a real simulation of the VLTI, we need to generate four beams. So this is the plan that we have in the future to have this system to generate us four identical beams. We want to experiment the LDC, so the system that is correcting the water vapor and the CO2 because it's a super critical part of the system and it's quite original. The system we want to use has never been done in other instruments or parts of it, but not fully. 
So we need to experiment prototypes of it to see if it can really work. And very soon, we will start to begin the assembly of the instrument with the final chip, and we will be able to characterize the performance and see if it corresponds to what I got uh, from the optical design. If some of you were lost in the technical details, these are the conclusions that you need to, that you can remember, I don't want to force you. The NOT instrument is adapted to image exoplanets that are near the snow line. I showed you that our exoplanet yield is telling us that we expect to be the first one to actually image a core equation planet, which is a very interesting scientific project. The instrumental performances are respecting the requirements that we have on the null depth and the throughput for exoplanets imaging. It's important to remember that vibrations, uh, water vapor and CO2 dispersions are very critical in the L-band and in the infrared. And when you do interferometry and nulling interferometry, you need to think of a way to correct these uh, problems. And finally, if the NOT instrument is successful, this can be a technology demonstrator for more ambitious projects like, for example, the live space mission. And thank you, and it's 45 minutes. Thanks, Germain, for a wonderful talk and very clear explanation of what uh, interferometry is and, more importantly, what new interferometry There will be a is. test tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can uh, run a questionnaire here. Also, I must admit that you're uh, excellent in actually identifying what you're responsible and irresponsible for. That's uh, <laughs> amazing to see. <laughs> Time for questions. All right, so I'll start from the front and go that way. Hi, great talk. I thought it was clear. I was not lost in technical details, I swear. Um, <laughs> I, I have you. a potentially very dumb question, but you showed the kind of the pattern where we will be, where the visibility is, which was the stripey pattern for the, I mean, this? you don't have to go, no, 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 way at the start. You show which parts would be visible and where yes, the light yes, is cancelled out. Yes, the transmission uh, yeah, map. Yeah, the yes. transmission, yeah. Yep, yep. So this is a stripey pattern. Is It seems to me like there's quite a lot of information lost. Is there a way to kind of fill this in and have a horizontal stripey pattern? <laughs> or does this require more telescopes or what does it? Yes, indeed. So I will still go back because because I think it's important. Yeah, because this transmission map is not fixed in time. Uh, yes, this one. This transmission map is not fixed in time. It depends on the orientation of your baseline compared to the sky. So on the ground, we have something magical that is the Earth rotation. So ah. during the <laughs> night, these fringes are actually moving and turning. So it means that if you know where is the exoplanet that you're interested in, you can calculate what is the orientation that you need. So at the VLTI, you can deal with the baseline to have the one in the right orientation, or you can wait for the right time to observe when the planet is at the center of a white fringe so that the transmission will be maximum. Okay. Also, this is for two telescopes. When you use four telescopes, you get a more complicated transmission map. You still lose a part of it, but you have a quite a nice... Uh, sampling of the field of view from this. Okay, thank you. First of all, really nice talk, Germain. Super thank exciting you. stuff going on, which I didn't understand at all beforehand, but it was super clear. Uh, you, you mentioned that your null depth will be about a factor of 1,000, right? So you will be able to reduce the star's light to, well, 10 to the minus 3. Uh, but the planets you wanted to look at, the contrast was more 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So I was wondering, will you detect the planet as a perturbation on top of the base null depth, or how will you do that? So it's a good question. I didn't have time to go uh, over this. Uh, you're right to, to, to tell me about this. So this is on not only for nulling interferometry. This is onlo also apl applicable for coronagraphy. You have a difference between the null depth that you get from your instrument, that we call the raw null depth, or the instrumental null depth, and the actual one that you get after data processing and um, 
after yeah data correction. So usually, usually if we have 10 minus 3 after the instrument, then after post-processing, we expect to have another factor 100. And this is also what's applicable for coronagraphy. They have a factor 100 after post-processing. So you can improve the null depth after the instrument in the data to get a factor 100. And you see 10 minus 5 is indeed uh, good enough to reach planets that are two my, my 10 minus 4, 10 minus 5 contrast. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great, great talk. Um, I had a question about your dual in your uh, in your instrument. Uh, yes. So you 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 hinted on the challenges you have in in designing this, but to understand that each of these mirrors has some kind of weird hyperbolic shape or so to, to exactly have a, yeah exactly kind of the the um, the problem is that they are not flat mirrors; they are actually spherical mirrors and they are attached to each other. So it was a bit more complicated because, for example, the, the slicer ID is not new. It was used, it, it is used in, uh, how is it called, integral field uh, spectroscopy, where it's a bit the opposite. In integral field spectroscopy, spectroscopy, you get the light from one telescope, and then you have a slicer that is, depending on the, pr the origin of the light in your field of view, it is directing it to a different pixel. And here it's the opposite. We have different lights, and we want to recombine and send it all to the same direction. But in our case, the extra difficulty was, yes, these mirrors are not flat. They are spherical mirrors, which was necessary for technical reasons I will not develop unless you ask for it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. What are, no, I'm not going to ask. It. Just what, what is it made of? What, what is the material that it's made of? Um, it is made of aluminum. Uh, I think, aluminium, and then we have a coating of uh, a silver coating uh, on top of it. I wish it could be gold coating because it would be even more of a jewel like this, but uh, silver coating was really more interesting for us. It's amazing. You guys found a way to control the earth rotation. Maybe you can also <laughs> think of controlling the observatory vibrations. Eh? Hi, Germain. Great talk. Thank you. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I expect. Um, so, so my first question is, with the nulling interferometry, the goal is to, I guess, null the, the starlight so that you can see either yeah, an exozodiacal dust or a, a planet going around the star. Is, is there a risk that you accidentally also null maybe the exoplanet that is going around the star? Or all of this is based on DR3 data, so you ex you can expect where the planet will be, maybe by the time you observe? So question. this is exactly yeah, the information that the transmission map is giving us, is that if, unfortunately, a planet falls in a dark fringe, then the planet will also suffer from destructive interference and the light will not reach the detector. It's not such a problem for disks, because disks are like resolved objects, so if some part of the disk are not visible, other parts will be, unless really the disk is edge-on and perfectly parallel to another dark <laughs> fringe, but this is unlikely. And for a planet, yes, yeah, so the best way for a planet to be sure that it's here is to first detect it using another method to know that a planet is here, roughly estimate the position of the planet at a certain time, and then do your nulling interferometry in a way that the planet is uh, in a white fringe. Thank you. My second question, um, you mentioned that you expect most planets to be near the snow line, so it makes it a very attractive area to do research on. Why do you expect that? <laughs> well, we are getting in some um, <laughs> theoretical astrophysics, and I have to admit I, I am not the one that worked on the science cases. My, my colleague, um, Colin, was the one uh, working on this. Um, wh from what I understood, there is something to do with the protoplanetary disk. Um, and the snow line is like a region where something is happening during the planet formation, so that when planets are migrating towards the center, they are stopped close to the snow line because of this reason. And so uh, that's why we expect to have a lot of planets there, because the migration processes is expected to stop or uh, slow down at this uh, distance. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Jamma. Thanks for the captivating talk. Thank you. Um, my question is really on the choice of L band for not. Um, so one is, f the first one is about the location. Why is it important? And second is, why use a s single band? Is it uh, like it gives an advantage over multiple bands like that of Bifrost? So uh, thank you for the question. So why the L band? If it would have been better to go to the M band, that's for sure, because if you look, the contrast is even lower there. All the problem is coming from the chip. The technology for the chip has only recently been available for the L band. So in Peony and Gravity, they also use chips like the one we use, but in the H and K band. And it's only very recently that the technology was available to do it in the L band. And unfortunately, in the M band or further in the infrared is not possible yet for the chip. And indeed, it will be ev very nice to also have information from several bands at the same time. But again, s a chip that is optimized in the L band is not optimized in other uh, bands for other wavelengths. So for now, you can see the region we c where the chip is optimized is, is quite small. It's uh, between 3.5 and 4 micrometer. So for now, there's no technology to have a chip that would work with a wide band uh, system. And for noodling interferometry, the use of chip is very important uh, at this stage. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, also further in the infrared, the background of the thermal background of the sky and the instrument uh, makes it uh, not worthwhile to actually do nulling because you're no, no longer limited by photon noise from the, the star, but actually photon noise from the sky itself. Um, yeah, so L band is kind of a compromise, and even, even then, it's kind of pushing the limit a little bit of that. Are you sure? Because the LBTI is doing nulling in the end band. Ah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, really nice talk, Joanne. Um, Thank you. You had this a very pretty yellow glass with all the little channels going through it. Um, forgive the ignorance of this question, but you said at some point that the two channels that come very close together yes. interfere with each other. Yes. My uh, very elementary memory of undergrad is that photons don't interact even when they're in the same place. How do you get them to interact if they're separated by this, this distance? <sighs> Because I had this question before, I don't remember who was asking me, and my answer was not satisfying for them. <laughs> uh, it is, <laughs> so th there is something, I would like to say uh, it's magic or it's quantic, okay. but uh, maybe I can give something. It's like when you confine a wave, an electromagnetic wave in such a small region, what's happening is that you have a distribution. So this is your waveguide that has like a certain width. And then if you want to confine your wave inside, you will have some evanescent lights outside of here. You see, at some point, you, if you try to confine it in a, uh, a very small region, you have a quantum effect that makes the photons, uh, the, the wave of the photons is like, they can be, yeah, Romain wants to uh, precise this. Yeah, so, so that's an that's a important part of it. So it's the evanescent part of the wave that kind of overflows a little bit the waveguide, and that's the part that's interacting and, and uh, interacting between the waveguides. But I think the thing that is misleading and that uh, your question is about is um, the, the fact that you use the plural, uh, talking about photons interacting here, indeed there are a bunch of photons, but was, what is interacting is actually one photon uh, traveling in both waveguides, right? So it's the, it's the whole um, uh, dual slit experiment, right? It's a photon interacting with itself, right? And that's why you need the coherence length. That's, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> half yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this, that, that will make you think a bit. <laughs> I was 
I was actually asking a colleague of mine to explain it to me because uh, he was working on this chip and he told me that he is going to write a chapter of a book based on this. So I will read it to have a good understanding of the quantum effect happening uh, at this point to try to have a better explanation. But I have a recipe for you guys. We have coffee, we have kitchen, and uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Germain. Uh, allow me to ask uh, one more science question. Yes. Um, so you, you want to do exoplanet imaging, but can you also do precision astrometry, for example, <coughs> like we do with uh, gravity or Pioneer? Ooh. <laughs> That's a good question. I know that uh, Bifrost will do uh, astrometry. Mm -hmm. uh, it is made for this. I am not sure if uh, not is uh, made for astrometry because it's no, great it's if you not have Oma a is, uh, telling me no it's not no? Uh, uh -huh. it's not made for astrometry no because if you have a resolution that's four times better than a regular interferometer you can get to closer separations yes but uh, there is a trick uh, in the in the instrument that I didn't want to go in, in details of this is that the problem is if you take the transmission map mm -hmm. that we get this is what the interferometer is seeing. Yeah. But all of this, all of this light is combined together. So uh, it's, it's a bit tricky, but I in a simple way, I should not say it like this, but in a simple way, you kind of lose the information of where the light is coming from. Yes. Ah, OK. Oh, yeah. Because so all the light it. is yeah. sh uh, showered in the, in the chip. OK. And so I I yeah, it's. It's a bit like this. It's it's complicated. I'm not sure I understand it perfectly uh, uh -huh. too because we are still supposed to do imaging with this. But from what I understood, we kind of lose uh, the information of where this light is coming from. We just know that it's coming from somewhere where the transmission is possible. And I guess superimposing different images, can you? You can actually, yeah, you can try if you have different patterns mm -hmm. and then, but that requires a lot of observation yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. Okay. So not very efficient for astrometry yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. if you want to do it. Thank you. All right, we are at the hour. I wasn't joking about coffee, yeah? so we still have coffee. No longer cookies, but coffee. So, uh, <laughs> enjoy it. Thank you, guys. Let's thank German again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Until next Thursday, enjoy your lunch.